One of the changing natures of not just banking, but this is a societal change in general, is that we're moving away from individual shareholder ownership to more institutional shareholder ownership. Maybe you can experience this in your own experiences where maybe you have a 401k or you have mutual funds. It's much more common to see T. Rowe Price as a significant investor than it is to have the hardware store owner down the street be a significant investor in a community financial institution. And the reason being is we are now into this away from pension funds, we're going into more 401ks, and therefore the T. Rowe Prices, the Vanguards, the Fidelities of the world uh, are starting to own significant amount of ownership in financial institutions. If you looked at the top shareholders of most publicly traded financial institutions, you'll see very common names like uh, BlackRock, a very large uh, investment fund based in, in New York City. You'll see um, um, uh, T. Rowe Price, for example, or Vanguard or Fidelity as significant shareholders. So having shareholder meetings like this is starting to morph into also going around and shaking the hands of the institutional shareholders because that's where our money is. I could say myself that I, I have 401k and all I do is put it on autopilot and I invest in mutual funds. Uh, so it's becoming more of an institutional shareholder ownership. FNM Trust, in contrast, actually only has 2% institutional ownership. 98% of your bank is owned by people like you. Uh, most of the shareholders are probably anywhere from Franklin up to Cumberland and Dauphin County uh, in Pennsylvania. So that is an advantage, but it does take active part, uh, communication with your shareholders to maintain that interest in community banking. So one of the changes in community banking, a trend that's not going to stop, think about your children. And do your children own individual shares of financial institutions or do they own mutual funds? So there, this trend is going to continue and it puts a little more pressure and diversity on management teams to make sure that they're talking to the folks that will own their shares uh, in the future. Bill mentioned Basel III too, also the, sh the requirements for capital is definitely tilted towards common equity. Uh, it's um, uh, because there's a common equity, common equity tier one ratio as the calculation for Basel III. And of course, FNM Trust meets all the regulatory requirements uh, and has plenty of, well, there's no such thing as plenty of capital, is there? But uh, uh, it's very well capitalized in terms of the ratios. Another significant change, if you look at the chart that's in front of you, is branching. Tim mentioned, I think it was Tim, mentioned the consolidation of a few community bank branches. And the consolidation of branches has really been going on since 2010 or 2011, but it has been led by the very largest financial institutions. If you look at a Wells Fargo, for example, they have 6,300 branches. Wells Fargo has 6,300 6, branches. By contrast, 24 here uh, at FNM Trust, but the large banks led the consolidation of branches, and the chart shows why. Because in 1970, we had more than uh, one branch in the United States supported more than twice the households than it currently supports. The trend was unsustainable. It was unsustainable. We were diluting the amount of clients that we could possibly attract uh, into our branch system by just putting up a lot of branches. I mean, when I made the left-hand turn on to come to this restaurant, on each corner there was a bank, a uh, bank branch. Uh, and that trend is probably going to continue in terms of the consolidation of branches so we can grow this number and you can see that the, the trend has changed. So there's going to be fewer branches. The larger banks have led this charge. A couple reasons. One is larger financial institutions are much more clinical about their analysis if a branch can make it or not. Whereas a community bank, it, the CEO, the head of retail, they're tied to the communities. So it's a very difficult decision that goes beyond the spreadsheet to pull out of a, a community. Uh, more so than it is a Wells Fargo who just sees it on a spreadsheet in San Francisco or in Minneapolis. Uh, they, they don't have those ties to the community, so it's more difficult 
for a community bank to say, look, we're not really succeeding or this is a small market, it's going to be very difficult for us to be profitable in this market, uh, let me talk to the mayor of the town. You don't have to worry about anybody at Bank of America saying, let me talk to the mayor of the town to close the branch. Uh, but the consolidation of branches are going to continue. Branches are going to expand in their capabilities. If we could go to the next slide, they talked about the Waynesboro branch, and that is much more uh, uh, um, an example of the branch of the future. I'll even go one step further that we're going to reduce the amount of personnel and branches probably to three or four full-time equivalent employees. I don't have any insights on, on where FNM and Trust is going with that. But they're now coming up with these interactive teller machines, which are really uh, high potency type uh, ATM machines that you actually talk to a teller based in the headquarters branch because transactions are going are declining in such uh, a, a great amount. We're now doing most of our transactions uh, online that branches are s s uh, stopping becoming transaction centers. And they're starting to become more consultative centers where people come in with problems to solve, uh, with money to borrow, they want to borrow money, or they just want some financial advice. This is going to cause a wholesale change in the type of persons that we have in the branches. And this could be actually a competitive advantage of a community bank, should they choose to accept it. And the reason why is there are uh, um, 250 full-time equivalent employees at 270. 270. 270 employees, but 250 FTEs, right? I like to use the clinical term, Bill. FTEs, right? Full-time equivalent employees. There's uh, 250,000 employees at Citibank. So for Citibank to change the capabilities of the employees in the branch will take a significant logistical and cultural effort. For a community bank, with fewer employees, fewer branches, it should not be so difficult. So if we're going to change the nature of what our branch people can do, be more sophisticated in helping you solve your problems, be more uh, advisory related than transaction related, a community bank has a distinctive competitive advantage because we have fewer people to deal with in terms of making that change. Also. 24 branches versus 6,300 branches that we have to make those changes to. So there's a dis definite competitive advantage in branching for the community bank. Let's move on. Technology is uh, uh, something very significant. On the way down here, I drive down 81, and um, I listened to a commercial on HL HLN for a $20 billion Pittsburgh-based bank, which uh, Bill had mentioned uh, is FNB, based in Pittsburgh. They're $20 billion in assets, and they were advertising on national satellite radio on HLN. And they ran off a litany of their electronic banking capabilities, all of which FNM Trust has. So the technology platforms to compete with the very largest financial institutions are in place. Now some of it is scary because community banks typically use three core processors, Fiserv, FSI, or Jack Henry. These names are all foreign to you because it's totally transparent to the, uh, to the customer and to the shareholder. But they own 85% of the community bank market. 85% of banks use Fiserv, FSI, or Jack Henry as their core processor, their, their baseline technology platform. The bad news is that gives them a lot of pricing power and leverage to use a lot of their modules. The good news is FSI has $6.5 billion of annual revenues. They have teams of programmers that are trying to fight off those Eastern Europeans that are trying to hack into banking systems every day. So we have economies of scale and technology. Community banks just use vendors to achieve that uh, economies of scale. And there's nothing wrong with that. In addition, we have these uh, fintech firms that are now penetrating the market. If you look at some of the eye-popping statistics that a Prosper, that a SoFi, 
that a lending club are putting out in terms of the money that they are lending, it starts to be a little scary. But the truth is, these fintech firms are now partnering with financial institutions. You remember that they used to call Prosper and Lending Club peer-to-peer -peer lending. But they've changed that. It's not just because of marketing. Right? The reason why they changed to marketplace lending versus peer-to-peer -peer lending is they didn't have enough peer lenders to lend their customers the money. So where do you think Lending Club and Prosper are turning to to lend their customers money? Come on, everybody. Banks. They're turning to banks. Uh, you probably heard some of the high-profile collaborations between OnDeck on Deck Capital, remember the commercials for On Deck Capital? You probably hear them on your radio. Uh, on Deck and, and Citigroup. Citigroup is using the On Deck technology to decision small ticket commercial loans, very small commercial loans. So On Deck is collaborating with Citibank. But guess what? On Deck will collaborate with community banks as well, bringing their technology prowess to the community banking's capabilities. All these others will also uh, partner with community banks. We have experience with this, right? Community banks use SBA, the Small Business uh, Association, to provide credit enhancement to loans that don't have a lot of, uh, 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 that aren't bankable, as, as, as it were. So community banks are used to partnering with third parties to find the opportunities to get credit in the hands of local borrowers. That trend will continue with community banks partnering with these fintech uh, firms. So the, the, the commercials that you hear for these firms and the, the concern that you have about uh, them absorbing uh, community banks are exaggerated to the extreme. The reason why is because community banks have the capital. There's a firm called Movin, you probably haven't heard of it, but it's a cool application on your smartphone that is really the face of, or the GUI as it were, for a checking account. Well, move and start it with $3 million of capital. Its predecessor and big brother firm, Simple, sold the BBVA, a bank. So all moving can do is it shows you that, oh, you, you underspent on your groceries this month by $100. Would you like to move it to your savings account? And you swipe it and you move it to your savings account. These type of technologies are out there available and they are anxious to do business with community banks. So technological advancements don't need to be housed in the community bank. They're being done out there and they're seeking partnerships with community banks. All right, let's move on. Uh, the economies of scale argument is one you hear frequently. It's over and over and over again you hear about economies of scale. And I bet you Bill and Tim probably liked this slide when they saw it. I don't know if you guys uh, remember seeing that. Because I put side by side, side by side, Franklin Financial Services financial performance next to Bank of America for 2015. Look at it. Absorb it a little. <laughs> And the reason why is because as financial institutions get larger, they experience what we term diseconomies of scale. In other words, their organization is getting so complex, it's getting very difficult to manage. And I always like to push back to Citigroup because all the smartest people in the room tend to, tend to be Citigroup. If you remember, in 2007 and 2008, Citigroup had probably one of the brightest management teams in the industry. Their board of directors were titans of industry, government, and finance. The former Secretary of Treasury, Robert Rubin, was on the board. He was an executive chairman. He was being paid as an employee when Citigroup needed to be bailed out by the United States government. In other words, all of those smart people in the room weren't smart enough to run Citigroup. And no matter how much Jamie Dimon stands behind the microphone and tells about how he knows how to run J.P. Morgan, he still has the London Whale trading loss and didn't even know what was going on. 
It's a very complicated organization, and it's very difficult to get their arms around, so they throw resources at it, and they experience the economies of scale that are exemplified by the financial performance actually going down for institutions that are over $10 billion of assets. My company does a podcast every month, and next month we have a guest from a $250 million in asset Oklahoma bank they're probably shielding themselves from potential tornadoes today, right? Has a 1.3% return on average assets. Now that is more difficult for a mid-Atlantic bank to achieve because of the cost of doing business in Oklahoma and the cost of doing business in Pennsylvania are different. But those people that go around and say you need to be bigger, you need to be bigger, you need to be bigger to be relevant are mostly investment bankers, right? There are diseconomies of scale of being so large that the complexity of your organization is too difficult to manage, so you throw resources at it. The community bank does not suffer that fate. So I'm bullish on the fact that community banks could actually out-earn the largest banks in the country. Can we go to the next slide? Here's another challenge. Uh, and front and center, right here at FNM Trust, did a leadership transition. The average age of the CEO in publicly traded community banks is 58 years old. Now this year I turned 50, so that doesn't sound so old to me now. As a matter of fact, I was actually uh, announcing at my daughter's lacrosse game the other night, and I had to go get the lineups from the coaches. And I got the lineup from the opposing coach, and then a girl who was keeping the book went to the coach and he goes, oh, I gave the lineup to that old guy. Seriously, you're retiring, not me. I got years to go. <laughs> what are you talking about here? So, but 58 years old is the average age of the CEO. And you know what? I don't think that's materially different than the average age of CEOs in industry worldwide. But there is a challenge that we're not raising bankers like we used to. What happened is community banks used to actually pilfer them from larger banks. But guess what? That environment is still rich. Look around the management team of FNM Trust and I see some Susquehanna people or some people from other financial institutions, some BB&T people. So community banks are still looking for talent uh, from the larger financial institutions that, that toss in the keys. So I don't think that uh, management succession at the top of, of the house is a significant problem. And you can see that right here at FNM Trust. You're having a smooth transition uh, uh, to this day. I do think that community banks are going to have to work hard at developing layers of leadership at each individual level. And that's something, again, when you have 250 or 270 employees, it's a lot easier to implement than when you have 6,300 employees. So Brian Moynihan might be sitting there in Charlotte, North Carolina. Actually, I think he lives and works in New York. Uh, even though the bank is headquartered in Charlotte, North Carolina, he might say we need to elevate the skill set of our employee base for the changing times and financial services, and 10 years later that might actually happen when you have so many employees. But not so for a community bank. They can move the ship farther, faster, and be more nimble in their employee base. So that's another advantage that community banks have over the very large financial institutions. Let's go to the next one, Matt. Uh, so I have a picture. Um, one thing Bill did not mention was I was a Navy guy, so I can curse if you'd like uh, some, some pointed language. There's nothing you could say to me that'll make me blush. Uh, but I put in front of you the uh, picture of Army training because the military training is a great paradigm for where community banking has to go to implement this change in financial services. And believe me, change is happening faster today than it has ever happened in financial services. It took, the ATM was implemented in 1972. It took 10 years till it became an accepted distribution point in financial services, 10 years. Mobile banking, it took a year and a half. So the pace of change is significantly faster than it was in the 1970s and the 1980s, and I don't think marijuana had anything to do with it. It's technology. 
So how do we adapt to these changes is how we develop our employees to adapt to these changes and serve your needs as customers. Serve your needs as customers. And community banks have an advantage because of the relatively smaller labor base. But we have to develop the curriculum, and I always point to the military because they do such a great job at it. If you are not fighting war, you are training to fight war. Before I actually led any sailors, I had to go to a school where they taught me nothing other than how to lead sailors. Community or banks in general tend to adopt the Peter Principle. They figure if somebody's a great mortgage originator, they'll make a great manager of the mortgage department. Has anybody ever met a mortgage originator? <laughs> right? We don't train people on supervision and leadership, but we have the opportunity to do so. Our strategic plan has changed, as Warren mentioned the strategic plan. The strategic plan is changing based on the needs of the customers in our communities. And we have the ability to adopt our employee base at a much quicker pace than the larger financial institutions. So I think that the development of our employees is a strategic advantage that we have over the very large financial institutions. They are big cruise ships. We're, we are much more nimble speedboats in financial institutions. So if I would uh, give you uh, a few of the takeaways, I think that community banking has a bright future. Do I think that we're going to start up a lot of startup banks? No, I don't. And the reason why is the first slide I showed you is the move to institutional investors. It's the, uh, it's the amount of capital that regulators are requiring for new startup banks. And, it's those, and the erosion of the retail investor also saying, wait a minute, if I have to start a bank with $20 million of equity, how long will it take me to earn a return on that equity? So I do think that bank startups will continue a very slow pace. I think the last bank might have started with 27 million of equity in New Hampshire. New Hampshire. The bank's name is Primary Bank. They clearly didn't have a marketing person when they came up with the name. <laughs> right? So, uh, so I don't think that we're going to have a lot of startups, which actually works to the advantage of banks like F&M Trust. Right? If you looked at that economies of scale slide, you'll see that F&M Trust is in that area where they could earn really good returns for the size of financial institution they are. Competitive returns, as we saw, they actually earn more money than Bank of America. So it serves to the advantage of uh, banks like F&M Trust that there's not a lot of startups that are trying to nip away at their heels and take their customers away. But it also uh, helps that the larger banks are consolidating. As Bill mentioned with BB&T, don't get me started on BB&T, uh, Metro and Integrity Bank uh, being bought all in the market area. It allows for talent and it allows for disgruntled customers. As I know from firsthand experience, I'm now a disgruntled M&T or BB&T customer. So I do think that there's a bright future for community banks. I do think that people are going to drive our industry forward and I think the ability of the community bank employee base will far exceed the ability of the larger BB&Ts of the world because they have a cruise ship that they have to turn around and F&M has a speedboat. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you.